Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to uh, invite you to all take your seats and we'll um, get started. On behalf of Columbia University, I'd like to welcome you to the, the symposium, Education, Development, and Social Justice, the Legacy of the Ford International Fellowships Program. My name is Sean Quimby. I'm the director of Columbia's Rare Book and Manuscript Library, the repository that, in 2011, the Ford Foundation chose to preserve the legacy of its most ambitious initiative. Today's event marks the successful completion of the archive portion of the project, while at the same time providing us with a preview of how the archive might inform research on global philanthropy, education, leadership, and social change in the years to come. As most of you know, the goal of the International Fellowships Program was to advance social justice by providing social, socially committed individuals in developing countries with access to education so that they might, in turn, return to their homes as leaders and as agents of social change. Between 2001 and 2013, the Ford Foundation provided $420 million in funding for more than 4,300 fellows from 22 different countries. You'll hear more about IFP, its aspirations, and its accomplishments from our speakers over the course of the afternoon, so I'd like to take a few moments to talk about the archive that it produced. As you can imagine, a $420 million investment produces a lot of paper. 447 linear feet, to be exact. In the new millennium, it also produces tens of thousands of digital files. And while paper may last centuries, digital files are much more ephemeral lasting only as long as the software required to read them. That's if you're lucky. The challenge and opportunity that Ford gave to Columbia was to develop the tools and workflows required to ingest, preserve, and provide access to an archive comprised not just of paper documents, but of zeros and ones. And lest we all forget, archives are much more than places to put stuff. They're trusted institutions that help to authenticate the past. Some of you may have read about the case of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, which in 2014 was shot down outside of uh, Donetsk, Ukraine. The Ukrainian separatist leader Igor Gherkin took responsibility on social media, only to then wipe the record clean by deleting the post. Had the Internet Archive in faraway California not captured the snapshot of the website, we may never have found out how those 298 passengers died. My point here is that not only are digital archives ephemeral, but that without them, justice, social or otherwise, is more elusive than ever. By choosing Columbia, Ford made an investment not only in its own history, but in advancing critical work that ensures that history and accountability endure, and which we're now sharing with libraries and archives around the world. The Archive Project is part of a broader Ford IFP alumni tracking study administered by the Institute of International Education. Launched in 2013, it follows the pathways and trajectories of the program's alumni. Last April, IIE released the report, Social Justice and Sustainable Change, the Impacts of Higher Education. Based on the responses of 2,000 alumni from 22 countries, it reveals that, quote, IFP alumni not only experienced personal and professional gains, they are driving tangible and sustainable change in their home communities, countries, and wider global society. And we'll have some copies of that report available after today's proceedings um, at the reception. Rajika Bandari, IIE's Director for Academic Mobility, Research, and, and Deputy Vice President for Research and Evaluation, has agreed to provide commentary on our first panel this afternoon. I'd like to take a moment to thank Rajika and her team at two tables here, um, including Alexa Rowland, Andrea Brown, and Mirka Martel for being such competent and enthusiastic partners and for helping us to administer the research awards program uh, that has made today possible. The truth is that I came to this project fairly late in the game, in the fall of 2014, and the people that I'd like to acknowledge next deserve far more credit than I for its success. For Columbia, Jim Neal, Michael Ryan, and Damon Jaggers provided leadership in the early stages, while Barbara Rockenbach and Ann Thornton have stewarded it more recently. My colleague, Stephen Davis, director of the digital program, and his team, including Ben Armentor, Dina Sokolova, 
and RBML's digital assets archivist Jane Grzeski put in the considerable and groundbreaking work to develop the technology and workflows required to preserve and provide access to this born digital record. So I'll pause for a moment to point to the uh, web portal. Um, rather than read the URL, which none of you will record accurately because it's, it's longer, I can, um, um, I can share it with you later or by email. Um, but uh, the portal is a, is a way that you can access portions of the digital archive, an integrated finding aid that combines both the uh, uh, digital and paper content, links to an archive of IFP websites, and contextual information about the program and its various offices. I'd like to thank archivists Annie Tamino, Chris Laco, and Celeste Brewer for processing the considerable pa paper archive. And special thanks to Celeste, who is um, right there, um, uh, <laughs> who uh, only arrived on the scene in July and uh, was given two months to coordinate this event while providing hands-on assistance to our research award winners. Uh, she's been simply amazing, so thank you, Celeste. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Yomari Chavez uh, in our HR department, who has helped to coordinate the visa process for our international winners. It has been a learning experience uh, for us, um, so thanks to her. Finally, of course, we owe the Ford Foundation a most hearty thanks. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with dedicated and energetic program officers like Doug Wood and Kay Lee and with Alan Dvac, who I've just met in person, that I feel like I've known for years, um, through whose skilled hands the archive passed before coming to Columbia. Philanthropic advisor Jane Pollan is also here with us, uh, as well as Hillary Pennington and the IFP Advisory Council. And then, of course, we have to thank the selection committee, and most especially the recipients of the IFP Archive Research Award who have all congregated at this table, um, which I think speaks to the um, um, kind of goodwill that they've enjoyed since coming to Columbia. Uh, many of them conducted research here on site, others from far afield, but most of them um, in both places. Uh, their work will inform how we provide access to the Born Digital Archives for years to come, while also shedding new light and raising new questions about the IFP and its legacy. So that was a long list of names. Uh, it could have been much longer, I'm sure. Um, but I think it just goes to say that it takes a very large village to preserve and provide access to the past. So a quick word on our program. We have two panels this afternoon, bracketed with remarks on either end, first by Joan Dassin and then by Kay Lee. We'll conclude at 5.30ish um, to celebrate with a reception. Um, and I hope you all can attend. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Joan Dassin. Dr. Dassin is currently Professor of International Education and Development and Director of the MA Program at Sustainable International Development. Uh, I think you win like the longest title of all the people that I've listed. I thought it was Rajika, but I just realized that it took two lines um, at Brandeis University's Heller School. Uh, she's the author of many article, articles and the recipient of countless awards and was, of course, the founding executive director of the Ford International Fellows Program. She's going to offer some reflections on the IFP some 15 years after its founding. So, thank you. This is a tall podium. Thank you. I think I'll do it this way. Thank you so much, Sean, and it's just a pleasure to be here to see some of my uh, old friends, like Raj uh, from South Africa, uh, and uh, many who have been involved in this IFP journey. And it, it occurred to me as we were, uh, and I understand this is the first uh, week of classes here at Columbia, and at Brandeis we had our first week a few weeks ago, uh, and the entering class is the class of 2020. So that made me think because we started IFP, this program, in the year 2000. So we are not only 15 years out, but looking within a reasonable time frame at 20 years uh, of experience uh, past the origins of this program. So I think it's a testimony to the importance of archives to be able to uh, trace why, why it is so important to keep this history. So what I wanted to do uh, in a few brief remarks was just share with you what were the ideas that we had going way back 
uh, behind this archive and why our program uh, invested uh, so much, not only financially, but in terms of time and care for the design in, a, a, in this archives project while the program was ongoing. Uh, and I, I wanted to start off, first of all, by thanking another long list of names, but just a few that are really critical for why we're standing here today. Uh, one is my colleague, uh, Mary Zaburkin, who was the Asia uh, and Russia director of the IFP program, and who had the original vision way back when we were still running the program about the importance of maintaining uh, not only a historical archive, but one that could produce resources and maintain resources for many generations of researchers to come. Uh, and also the other key person to acknowledge is Alan Divak. Alan was the archivist at the Ford Foundation and actually, um, after leaving Ford, moved about a block over to work with us uh, at the IFP program. And more than anyone on the IFP team, Alan is really responsible uh, for what we thought were very arcane issues like you know, size of digital records, the specifications for actually uh, cleaning the files and so on. It was a, just an enormous task. Uh, and Alan really shepherded it through for, from idea to realization. So I wanted to publicly thank him for all his efforts. So here's the question. Why did we embark on this uh, very ambitious effort? Uh, I think looking back now, I would say that really from the very beginning of this program, uh, we, and when I say we, the people at the Ford Foundation, myself, I actually started as a Ford Foundation employee and then we spun out this other organization, we worked with IIE. Uh, we were very um, conscious that the program was uh, a groundbreaking. There was a, a groundbreaking goal in terms of focusing on uh, a, a definition of excellence that wasn't only academic achievement, but included social commitment, leadership potential, things that have become actually criteria that are very accepted in today's scholarship world, but at the time uh, seemed rather uh, revolutionary. Uh, so we were aware of the fact that not only the objective, but also the design and the implementation of the program uh, were, were quite unique. Uh, when we created this organization uh, that spun out of the Ford Foundation, we in effect became a small operating foundation and re-granted portions of the Ford funds to dozens of local organizations around the world uh, that then went on the hunt for this fantastic talent that ultimately was recognized with the scholarships. So the extreme decentralization of the program, the social justice goals, uh, the way in which we envisioned the mobility of students, typically, it's, this is now more common, but in the, in, at the time, uh, particularly government programs will only fund students to study in the country, which is the origin of the funds. If you get a Fulbright scholarship, you come to the United States. And from the very beginning, we had this decentralized idea uh, where uh, our fellows could study anywhere in the world as long as that knowledge was what they had hoped to achieve. And at the end of the day, we had about uh, our over 4,000 fellows, but the other fact that's interesting is that they were studying in about 600 universities in nearly 50 countries. So we had this enormously decentralized system, and the only way to uh, ultimately uh, gather up and standardize the memory of this uh, system would, was through a centralized archive. So the design uh, uh, decisions about how the program was not only conceived of but actually implemented was from the very beginning drove our concern uh, with maintaining the records. Uh, I would also say that, um, you know, we thought it was, uh, from the very beginning we also had an awareness that we had to be able to contribute to research uh, about the impact of scholarships. Uh, and in order to participate in, in research and to actually produce 
not only documentation, but evidence that uh, this social justice objective of the program was something that we could achieve without sacrificing academic quality, uh, we needed to have uh, documentation. Uh, and we needed to, number one, establish that the people we were selecting actually met the criteria of the program, uh, and that uh, we also uh, had to understand how they were selected, each one in their local context, we didn't have uh, a unitary definition of what we meant by reaching out to people from marginalized backgrounds. That would have meant one thing in the United States. It would have meant another thing in Egypt, another thing in South Africa, another thing in Chile, Vietnam, and so on. And so the only way to actually uh, gauge whether we were meeting the objectives of the program was through a systematic study uh, of the documentation. Uh, and I think that um, the, from the early on, we were, uh, if not always, the most assiduous researchers, just for lack of time. We did spend a lot of effort on analyzing our work as we were going along. We like to think of ourselves as a thinking program. We produced a number of books. Uh, one that was published by the Social Science Research Council in 2009. We had a lot of uh, local documentation, books that were produced by our partners and others that they worked with, uh, because from the very beginning the idea was how do you capture all the m many, many multiple dimensions uh, of this program. Uh, to have simply a global view, while important, would have been inadequate to capture the richness and variation of each local experience. And conversely, the uh, study of simply one country or another wouldn't have been able to give you the rich comparative framework that you would need to actually ultimately assess the uh, overall impact uh, of, the, uh, of the program. So from, the, uh, from pretty much I would say maybe 2008 or 9, when we saw that the program was going to wind down, uh, we started this idea of how would, be, how would it be best to actually capture the documentation so that many generations of researchers uh, could use these materials and uh, struggle with the questions that we had struggled with as designers and as uh, practitioners working to turn this vision of scholarships and social change into a reality. Uh, and that's where Columbia University came in, uh, and that was also at a moment, and all of our partners coming from different uh, uh, backgrounds, different countries, had uh, a very mixed bag of records. Some were born digital, as the archivists like to say, and as Stephen knows well, this was a, a, a challenging uh, kind of issue. Others were paper records. Not to mention the issue of languages. You know, we had English as a lingua franca in the program, but the fellows themselves spoke many different languages. And since it uh, was not a requirement to study in the United States or another English-speaking program, uh, we had many offices, in fact, that didn't really function in English. They kind of grudgingly translated their uh, work into, uh, into English. But, uh, for example, my dearest friends in Brazil, the program there was known as the uh, Programa Internacional de Bolsas. It had a completely different acronym. It was administered by a local foundation, and that was the identity of the program. <clears throat> and they, didn't, they weren't big on English <laughs> in that <clears throat> particular context. So the challenge, uh, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk about this, to uh, archivists and the people who are actually pulling together these records uh, was enormous, not only because of the uh, various languages, the various origins, uh, and, uh, but also because of uh, the different types of records that existed. So I would just uh, like to say that going forward, uh, it is just a tremendous gratification and vindication of this idea to see how these young people, some IFP alums, but others not, uh, are actually using these materials because you don't build an archive for it just to sit there. Uh, you build it to be used. And uh, right now, uh, going forward, I'm still engaged in research about scholarships, social change, how you 
can actually create a jump from the individual agency of a scholarship to some kind of collective benefit that is implied in what a social change movement is all about. Uh, that is one of the, the uh, conundrums, really, that uh, the IIE tracking project is dealing with. And I think that the IFP experience is so rich that it will continue to illuminate uh, this very important question that is now very much at the center of how we think about international scholarships. They're so precious, they're so rare, uh, that more and more donors as well as administrators are thinking about what are the design features that will allow us to use these scholarships to promote the kind of benefits, broader benefits to societies, particularly developing countries, that we would like to see. So I think that uh, all along we were aware of this and now it's become, now our, our, our aspiration is being borne out by the fact that the uh, materials are being used, uh, that this effort to uh, not only document but to comprehend and to contextualize uh, the experience of IFP is really coming to fruition. So I want to thank uh, all my colleagues here at Columbia and Alan especially and all the people who've worked so hard uh, to make this project a reality. Uh, and I have to just tell you that it wasn't easy. Uh, when, uh, when, just as a personal anecdote, you know, before we actually uh, created the archives project, I went out to the University of Arkansas, uh, which has the Fulbright archives. And I wanted to see, well, you know, how did the largest U.S. government program, how did they actually do this? You know, and I kind of got to this library, and there was this old gentleman there, and he said, oh, wow, that's so interesting. No one has really asked about this in a very long time. <laughs> uh, and we went down to this basement, and there was a, a kind of a, a big book, a kind of an annex, a, a guide to these archives, which ended in 1984. And I, this was, you know, just a few years ago. So I said, well, what happened to the rest of the records? Uh, well, they're in Washington somewhere, he said. Uh, and that was really discouraging. So I thought, well, at the very least, if we are able to work with a highly professionalized and university partner like Columbia and putting these archives together, we're going to be able to create something that is accessible and usable uh, to teach us many things about this program that we couldn't possibly have imagined when we were doing it. So I want to thank you all. It was uh, I, I'm just delighted to be here and eager to hear the rest of the uh, proceedings. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rajika Bhandari with the Institute of International Education, where I serve as, and I will use only one title, Sean, um, where I serve as a Deputy Vice President for Research and Evaluation and where I've had um, the honor and pleasure of, uh, of um, overseeing what we call the Integrated Knowledge Management Project <clears throat> that the archives are a part of since about uh, 2012 when the IFP program was beginning to wrap up and um, IFF, which was the secretariat for the program that uh, Joan oversaw, and the foundation were really beginning to think about how do we really carry forward the legacy of such an incredibly impactful program. So um, the context Joan provided has been really valuable in understanding better where the program has been coming from and the original goals and motivations um, for um, how the program originated. And uh, both Columbia and IIE are now taking forward this legacy, both in terms of the archives project that we're here to talk about today, um, as well as uh, the, the alumni tracking study that we are carrying out at IIE, where over a 10-year period, we are trying to measure the many different types of impacts that uh, IFP alum, many of whom are in this room, um, are having on their communities, their countries, and, um, and on society at large. And Sean mentioned that we um, released uh, uh, our first ever report 
earlier this year, and we do have some copies available. And I would say that if there are researchers in this room, and of course we hope there are, given the theme of today's symposium, um, that you, um, in addition to the archives, uh, take the time to also follow our research study, because that's another way to really understand and better uh, and, and follow the impacts of uh, IFP over the next um, eight to 10 years. But today we are gathered to talk about another kind of impact that IIE can have, and that is the impact of serving as a resource for research and knowledge generation in uh, multiple fields, including, of course, global philanthropy. And um, it was really fascinating for me that when all the applications were coming in for this research fellowship and Sean was giving me regular updates, it was really interesting to see that the applicants came from so many different backgrounds and so many different disciplines, um, which was really evidence for the fact that um, the, the value of IFP and um, the information in the archives really goes um, beyond just a single narrow field and touches many different disciplines. So today, it's a real honor for me to chair the first of two sessions, which is focused on global themes, and that features the work of three of the fellows who received the fellowship. And um, two of them, actually, IFP alum, so that's also wonderful. And um, the format we'll follow is that I will introduce uh, each of them in the order in which they will speak, and I'll do that right now and we'll then turn it over to them. Each of them is going to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we want to leave enough time at the end for, um, for a good discussion. So our first speaker is going to be Dr. Uh, Wim de Jong, and um, he is a Dutch historian and political philosopher who obtained his PhD from Rotboud University. Nijmegen in 2014. And in 2014, he also held the Alexander Charters Fellowship at Syracuse University for research in adult education. He specializes in the history of democracy, notably the connection of democracy and education. He's currently developing a research project on the history of philanthropy and its connection with education and the social sciences, and is finishing a book on the history of Protestant education in the Netherlands, as well as working as a lecturer in, uh, at uh, Radboud University. And his presentation will focus on IFP and the training of social justice leaders. After Wim, we will have Budi Waluyo, who's uh, one of um, the IFP alum, and um, Budi is from Indonesia where he accomplished his basic education and his undergraduate degree. And soon after his graduation from Universitas Bengkulu in 2009, he received a master's degree scholarship for, from IFP and finished his uh, MA in Educational Technology um, at the University of Manchester in the UK. Then in, the 20, then in 2013, he received a Fulbright Fellowship also, and is now studying uh, for his PhD at uh, Lehigh University in Comparative and International Education. Um, he's been a teaching practitioner since he was a student, and he's put the theories he's learned into practice at different levels of uh, educational institutions. Um, something really interesting is that, in, that he was so inspired by the uniqueness of IFP that he established Sekola Teufel and Sekola Ingris, uh, which is a free, uh, free online courses for Indonesians. And he was also invited to prepare a TED talk on, um, on this very interesting initiative. And his um, presentation is going to use IFP as a case study to see how we can measure returns on national community development as a result of large scale scholarship programs. And our third speaker is going to be Dr. Raj Govinder, um, who is the Director of Arts and Culture of the Fazulu Natal Department of Arts and Culture. He's also the Social Cohesion and Nation Building Coordinator for the province of KwaZulu Natal. He holds a doctoral degree from University of KwaZulu Natal, which was supported by an IFP fellowship in 2005. 
He has also served as the past chairperson of the Ford Foundation Alumni Association within South Africa. He's received numerous awards, including the four Outstanding Young South Africans Award, uh, Africans Award, MEC's Award for the Most Outstanding Official in the Department of Arts and Culture, the Love to Live, Nelson Mandela Peace Award and the Premier Service Excellent Award. His presentation today will focus on research into the work of IFP Africa alumni in their quest to develop African leadership and to improve the quality of life of all Africans. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Wim, who's going to get us started. Good afternoon. Um... I first want to thank the RBML at Columbia and the Ford Foundation for uh, this great opportunity. Um, and um, <clears throat> in the past weeks, uh, I have been researching the archive of the IFP program from the perspective of one of its principal goals, uh, enhancing, supporting, and creating leadership for social justice among the some 44 hundred fellows in the program and this as all the presentations today is work in progress but uh, I will highlight some of my thoughts and findings and would like your comments on that of course um, and I apologize for the fact that due to this preliminary nature of the research I will be reading my paper to you today so IFP from the outset did not just want to be another scholarship program and not even be only unique in its affirmative action for people from disadvantaged backgrounds, but it wanted more. There was a belief underlying the program that an effective way to promote social change is through investing in the intellectual and social capital of people who would use their advanced education to support social changes in their countries of origin. And this is visible from this nice little picture in the archive. Um, leadership for social justice was at the center of what IFP wanted to achieve, connecting personal, global, and academic development, really put in the center here. So the IFP programmers then were faced with the problem of how to integrate the leadership training mission with the academic program of the participants. Um, and as we will see, this proved complex. I have looked in the extensive IFP records at the conferences called institutes, here pictured in the left corner of the uh, circle as LSJI, that's Leadership for Social Justice Institutes. Um, and these were conferences organized between 2002 and 2007. Um, uh, and um, yeah, what I've looked at are the, the the organization uh, of, the, of these conferences, the evaluations by the fellows and staff, and the struggles in conceptualizing leadership the IFP was faced with. The international partners of the IFP in the 22 countries complemented these institutes with their own leadership activities, which varied widely. So leadership potential was one of the criteria for selection of the fellows. The slipperiness of the concept of leadership was directly illustrated by this because it varied widely how the partnering institutions in the diverse countries would interpret this. In China, for instance, they saw it as a question of track record uh, of, uh, as a community-minded person and personal integrity, while in Chile and Peru, the potential impact of their project on their communities was quite explicitly used as a criterion. The leadership program of the IFP was a supplement to the rest of the academic program of the fellows and it posed a sort of problem. This made it tough in itself to integrate it with all the different trajectories of the fellows and to realize the ambition of making it uh, an integral part of the IFP program. In the several week-long conferences, uh, to not be a completely isolated event, uh, were attached to an online um, 
environment in which students could prepare and network and comment on each other. But um, yeah, it was, however, tough to let fellows participate in this online community very much, enough uh, uh, for the, what the programmers wanted. <coughs> uh, which may have had to do with the intensity of their academic study programs. So I will now briefly go over a few aspects and tensions involved in the leadership training. Um, the first is the definition of leadership univer <coughs> universalism versus multiculturalism. In their preparations, the School for International Training, which uh, the IFP cooperated with, underlying a multicultural approach based on different societal notions, as they said, yeah, they call it. Um, and also to imbue that in the fellows. Uh, Cross-cultural exchange was seen as highly important. For this reason, in the beginning years of IFP, big conferences in which people from all over the world were confronted with each other were preferred. There were fears that otherwise fellows would stay too much in their own cultural sphere. Um, and in this slide, at the, sort of the third bullet point, uh, I think, um, this was summed up as, quote, specific manifestations and possibly relative importance of these above in different cultures and political contexts, not universal. So there was a big awareness of yeah, the, uh, having attention to different cultures. But there was also the contrary tendency to a universal model of leadership in the statements and in the questionnaires. <coughs> leadership as a collective enterprise, not individualistic, not authoritarian. It was about crossing boundaries and involving everyone in the process. Interestingly, this was also with an eye on the possible future of the IFP alumni as is also uh, uh, visible on this slide, um, they would need a global awareness if they would be working for NGOs or governments. Um, the collective serving idea of leadership was also visible in the surveys uh, uh, on leadership that the fellows were asked to fill in. A reflection on the impact of your personal feelings on others, active respect and interest in others. Those were notions that were deemed very important, as was visible from the 6L model of leadership, developed by S.A. Termisi from the School for International Training. This is one of those questionnaires that they uh, had to fill in. And uh, this 6L model, uh, th those are the, the six L's are leading and incurring cha encouraging change, living by example, lauding achievement, lending a vision, lever leveraging learning and development, and finally looking out for others. So it's a very social uh, idea. Um, so one might say that there was a keen awareness of multiculturalism, but also a definite model of how to approach it, which molded the fellow. So there was a bit of a tension there. Two, centralism versus decentral approach. Global versus local visions of leadership. Well, until 2007, <coughs> the tendency was to hold large conferences in the United States or other places in the developed Western world. And fellows from all over the world would fly in. And while the fellows were very enthusiastic about meeting people from other contexts and eagerly made use of the network opportunities, they also complained about the abstract content of much of the program. Language issues added to the atmosphere of generalizing and abstract notions of leadership, um, while fellows wanted more attention for specific and concrete issues. In the conference in Washington in 2005, keynote lectures with theoretical content were evaluated very critically by many fe fellows, um, <coughs> well, they said they appreciated sessions on leadership conversations where people from the field enter dialogue on their personal and collective journeys. But the fellows turned out to bond mainly with people from their own region. And this is why it was decided that a conference in Oaxaca, Mexico in 2004 would be approached differently. With only Spanish and Portuguese as the language used, 
And also with an on-site visit to local disadvantaged communities, such as the indigenous Indian population and civil society actors working with them. Evaluations of these activities were rather positive. This was much more concrete and showed firsthand what leadership for social justice meant. A third type of conference was mainly skills-based and evaluated positively by fellows also. And it's no surprise when we look at the kind of practical leadership skills fellows said they wanted to learn. One of the reasons for hesitancy to uh, decentralize the leadership training was that there was great ambivalence with IFP as to what kind of leaders they wanted to create, or rather wanting a lot of things at the same time. They wanted to create people with a global mindset, an intercultural awareness, assuming ideas char characteristic of a sort of international NGO elite, but they at the same time were very keen on multiculturalism, as uh, uh, noted. Um, and this tension was fundamental to IFP since its infancy. In a long 20, 2006 dialogue interview of IFP programmer Mary Zerbuchen and Brad Smith, vice president in the New York headquarters res and responsible for the global peace and social justice program at the time, uh, who came up and was one of the originators of the IFP program, well, they talked about a discussion among the originators of uh, uh, the fellowship program about the portability of the scholarship. Because as noted, one of the remarkable features of the IFP program has been that it did not require fellows to go abroad, thus enabling older, older students with families to study at a university in their home country, such as uh, Varj uh, did, for instance. Smith. Um, uh, even wanted to make this compulsory, as many of the participating countries, such as South Africa, had outstanding universities to his mind. And then you could have had something in the order of 8,000 fellows, perhaps. But he was struck by the importance attached by his colleagues to the portability of the scholarship, the enabling of students to go to universities like Princeton, and he claimed Ford Foundation President Susan Beresford was even disappointed that so many students chose uh, home universities. And Zerbe uh, 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 thought that the new president, Luis Ubinas, was uh, also of that view. And that's, that's interesting that there was a sort of re resistance against radically decentralizing IFP in this way. Uh, um, which points out the importance of, of uh, for the foundation to draw the fellows into also into a Western global perspective. Um, nevertheless, for reasons of effectivity, the institutes on leadership for social justice from seven, 2007 onwards were decentralized. Um, uh, and the upcoming alumni organizations were much more involved with them getting subsidies to organize regional conferences. And this fitted in with the goal of empowerment and acknowledgement of the leadership capacities of fellows who saw their involvement in the organization of those LSJ activities uh, as only natural. That's the third point, the effect of leadership training on fellows, empowerment and paternalism. Well, the LSJ institutes, uh, they oscillated between acknowledging that these people were already leaders and wanting to train them to be leaders. And this was a complicated dynamic between the organizers and the fellows. They were selected on the basis of the idea that they were people that were strong enough to acquire at least some higher education despite their tough challenges to arrive there and it needed a lot of self-confidence to get there. In the first conferences, surveys were given to the fellows on what kind of leadership training they wanted. What were their priorities? The organization for which the IFP collaborated with uh, the School for International Training tried to award that, uh, the, those preferences a place in the program, but they also wanted to put across their own leadership ideas in keynote lectures by development workers or people from NGOs. So these institutes had the paradoxical effect of also putting the fellows in a situation where they were supposed to learn how to be a leader. One of the consultative meetings uh, uh, on the LSJI program in 2004 stated that, quote, LSJI should aim at transforming fellows who are potential leaders into leaders, end of quote. 
Um, <coughs> But uh, yeah, um, those, there was, um, as uh, Mrs. Dessen has said, eh, there was constant evaluation by the programmers during the program. This was also the case for this uh, uh, aspect. The, those institutes evolved due to those constant evaluation. And the realization was made that instead of filling the conference program to the brim with activities, they should rather let the fellows themselves do more. A progress report from 2005 uh, said that using the leadership knowledge and practical experience that fellows already possess is a tool that has been underutilized and that alumni would be able to plan and run LSJ programs. Uh, and this was a few years into the program and it was also become, when it also became possible to do that because uh, IFP had spawned uh, alumni. Um, Fourth point, leadership and life after IFP. What happened to the IFP fellows after graduation uh, was and is something the foundation has a keen interest in. IFP has been very adamant about how 80% of the fellows returned to or stayed in their home countries. There is nothing, nonetheless a paradox in this um, because um, I would say that brain drain is not something that is only an issue from country to country. What should be noted is that a higher education program like this socializes people to become an elite. It may cause uh, a personality change, which is exactly the point of an education. They did not only acquire skills, but a world opened up for them with a different career perspective. And uh, uh, that is something that uh, the other presentations will uh, go deeper into. Because due to their good education, one can wonder if a former fellow wants to return to her village to start or continue a social movement, or wants a more detached job, which can have a link with social justice, as the statistics of the foundation uh, show. But this can, however, also mean a brain drain from, for instance, villages to urban contexts, or from activists to workers in government administration. Their contribu contribution to furthering social change in that capacity can become rather vague and indirect, as the IFP programmers themselves acknowledge. This is also uh, 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 one of the first points on this slide, which uh, uh, the picture is a bit small. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the first points uh, really addresses this quite directly, that uh, many of the IFP people will get a sort of indirect role uh, in social justice. So it's, it's pretty uh, explicitly acknowledged. Concluding remarks. <coughs> well, the ma materials I showed make clear how valuable the archive collection has been to me and other researchers. The extensive papers of a scholarship program are quite unique for their extensiveness and accessibility. I understood that, for instance, with other scholarship programs such as Fulbright or Rhodes, this is less the case. And one can pinpoint the conceptualization and daily process of a scholarship program quite well in this way. And the tensions involved in trying to run a mammoth undertaking such as IFP, and also attaching a whole leadership program to it. My preliminary findings show how IFP had to negotiate its universalizing, centralizing tendencies with its very real commitment to exactly the local and multicultural and decentralized nature of leadership for social justice. And this was not always easy. That the localizing tendencies won out was in many ways actually logical. As the program moved along, it slowly had to start thinking about its legacy building. Because from the economic crisis of 2008 onwards, it became increasingly clear that it could not be continued to the bereavement of the people involved. The alumni organizations were looked upon as the legacy bearers uh, for uh, IFP. It coincided with an increasing acknowledgement of the leadership skills already possessed by fellows who were involved more and more in their own training as leaders for social justice. I thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. Hopefully you don't, you're not going to fall asleep when I'm explaining my, my research. 
So, my name is Budi Waluyo. I'm from Indonesia. Yeah, I received a IV scholarship from Masters in 2010. And I finished my Masters in 2012, and then I applied for Fulbright in 2013. And now I'm studying PhD at Lehigh University with Fulbright scholarship. IFP and Fulbright scholarship have been like part of my life right now. And especially IFP is very, very like, I cannot run from it, I think, because it's like, <laughs> Yeah, it's like um, when the first year I came here, my professor just like reviewed this book and the book is about uh, the legacy of IFP. It's like, <laughs> and then I applied for this fun, uh, this research and I got it and I'm here and then I get to see Yon Daisin. That is very an honor. <laughs> All right. Um, so the title of my research is Measuring National Community Development Returns from International Scholarship Programs. And I would like to use uh, International Fellowship Program uh, from foundations as a case study. I'm aware of uh, the IFP impact study and also the uh, IFP alumni tracking study. It's a huge study and really, uh, I think, influential. And um, what I'm trying to do here is to put, um, I don't want to do something that uh, other people have been doing or are doing. So in this research, what I'm, been, what I'm trying to do is to put those um, benefits or advantages or something like that into a theory perspectives. I think if you, if you, are, uh, if you keep talking about uh, this is the, the benefits or impact given by IFP uh, scholarships, Maybe if you don't put it in a theory perspective, probably um, uh, it's like we need to, to put in a theory perspective in, in order to be discussed in literature. So this is my, the title of my research. And I would like to carry out this research further to my dissertation proposal. So I will officially start working on it this month. So this presentation will highlight some key preliminary findings. The data given to me is like, it's huge, and I would like to say thanks to Jane and Silas that have helped me uh, in my data collection. And I would like to finish my PhD with this research, hopefully next year, finger crossed. <laughs> okay. Um, so to begin with, actually, uh, recently, um, Countries around the world, regardless of the level of economic growth and national development, they um, have invested huge amounts of money uh, in the form of international scholarship programs, which provides citizens to pursue master's and doctoral degrees at universities in, at, in foreign countries. However, it's like the the basic concept of giving scholarship is that it requires huge amount of money, but you can only give it to a few people only, right? But the expectation is to get um, that the recipients will give impact to more people, to their home countries. So if this kind of investment doesn't give the return that you expect, so this is not a worthy investment. That is kind of the, the simple logics behind it. There is a study from PER 2014. Uh, they found that about 196 countries in the world possess at least one international scholarship program. The rest implement more than one scholarship program. So this, is, this trend really shows that this is considered a worthy investment that uh, it is worthy investment in individuals, private and public goods, and the, the impact may exceed the, uh, the expensive costs spent in the, in, the, in the programs, but clearly in the research, it's not really empirically proven. So this project has, um, like I have reviewed some uh, studies in the literature, most of it uh, focus on the economic success of the scholarship recipients studying in the host country, internationalization of the university's curriculum and the effects of international students, and so on. 
there are some research focusing on Fulbright scholarships and the impact on um, the recipients' home countries. But the focus has been so much on cultural exchanges, uh, how the, the recipients uh, experience the study in, uh, in the host countries and how, how it impacts their professional development and uh, career in the future. But I think a comparative study that really highlight what really uh, the returns that is given by scholarship recipients beyond cultures and professional developments, it is important because really if you come to a country now, like most of countries in the world implement international scholarship programs. So this project focuses on the impact of international scholarship programs on the reduction of social and economic inequalities and expanding economic and social opportunities for individuals and communities in the participating nations. Here, I focus uh, specifically on IFP. For foundation, there is national government sponsored scholarships, like a uh, scholarship provided by a national government, like my country, we have it, China government, almost all country has it. There is also national uh, foreign, uh, sponsor, uh, foreign, uh, foreign government sponsored scholarships, like Fulbright. They, gave, uh, they give scholarships to other countries to pursue uh, degrees in uh, the countries that provide the scholarships, uh, Australian governments, German, uh, Germany also provide that kind of scholarship. So there are several types of scholarships. And I pick up uh, IFP scholarships uh, beside I got this grant. The other reason is that IFP is very unique. You can barely find uh, this kind of scholarship right now. I'm very thankful with IFP because if I didn't get that scholarship, I wouldn't be here. Because at the time, um, most of the scholarship right now put like, one of the requirements is TOEFL. So you have to have TOEFL score to apply for that. To have a TOEFL score that meet the standard, you have to take TOEFL course. That means you have to pay. And if you take the course and you can learn well, and then, well, if you don't get a score, you probably have to take it again and you have to pay again. At the time I was very, I did not ha have any money and I feel really helped me because they pay everything. So that is the thing that I think nowadays most uh, scholarship sponsors forget about. They mainly focuses on how uh, the money that they give to the recipients is guaranteed in terms of the academic success. So the recipients have to uh, meet the language requirements. Why? Because that is the standard that we can use to measure that to the recipients will be successful in their study. If not, our money will be like uh, wasted, right? So that kind of thing now I think most of scholarships have in their mind, even in national government scholarship. But the thing is, these scholarships, instead of, instead of uh, closing the gap, they are actually widening the gap. Because those who live in villages, they don't know about TOEFL. So how can they apply for that scholarship? So in my research questions, uh, there are two research questions. First of all, uh, how do scholarship recipients contribute to national community development of their home countries? specifically on addressing inequality and expanding economy and social opportunities in the nation. I would like to frame these kind of uh, returns uh, by using human capital theory. And then the second one in how can the home countries benefit from recipients' social and cultural capital resulting from their international scholarship and associated activities. And I'm using social and cultural capital theories in this uh, research question. So I would like to uh, review uh, just briefly about the theory because I think this is important when we want to discuss about the returns given by IFP alumni. So the first one is human capital. It is simply about um, how we educate our citizens and we focus on knowledge and skills once we have 
uh, knowledgeable, knowledgeable and skillful citizens, they will be able to build our countries. I mean, they have skill and they have knowledge. There you go, you can build your country. That is uh, the simple uh, concept of human capital, but some people use that for economic returns, like if you have knowledge, like you invest some money for your education, and then you get a job, uh, that's your, your job, like uh, pay off what you spent before, or you earn less than what you spent before. So that kind of investment as well for human capital. And human capital theory here, I would like to use it for uh, looking at uh, the returns from the recipients in terms of knowledge and skills that they obtained and what they did, that, what they, they have done with those kind of knowledge and skill to their home countries. And the social capital renewal, we knew, we understand that uh, when, you, when we study in other countries, we got a lot of connections. In our class, we, have, uh, we, get, we got to know uh, people from other countries. Uh, and then we also built network with professors. Um, so that kind of uh, connections is considered as a social capital and how it can benefit their home countries after they finish their study. I have to speed up my presentation. Rajika is smiling at me. So <laughs> cultural capital is more about um, the degree certificate. So what can you do with that degree certificate? Um, will you get a, a better employment after that? Or just the same? So recipients also graduate with academic knowledge and competence, distinguishing them from others. This is also the concept of uh, cultural capital. So the methodology, as I said, this is only a small part of the research that I will be carrying this month, actually. Uh, and um, it uses quantitative and qualitative methods. I uh, would like to analyze 25 IFV country recipients, the alumni. And I have quantitative data already uh, from the Center for Higher Education Policy and Studies. And uh, I will need some quality, and I will need to collect some qualitative data. I have already had the IFP grant files, and maybe I'm interested in looking at the, the details from the alumni. I really want to conduct some interview with the alumni from these 24, uh, 24 22 IFP countries recipients. This is uh, the methodology in my research. Uh, before I present my pre preliminary findings, it is probably important to uh, understand what kind of backgrounds that IFP alumni have and how different they are from other scholarship recipients. So this, this is a descriptive statistic about uh, criteria that the IFP recipient think um, very important in determining the success of their application. So they have received the, they received the, the IFP uh, uh, for foundation and this criteria that they consider very important might be parts of their backgrounds. So like being excluded from education, uh, about 39.5% uh, of them say uh, this is very important. Being excluded, from, being excluded from higher education and prior social commitment. Prior social commitment, 73.7%. Uh, 73, this is huge because uh, it means that um, most of the scholarship IP uh, recipients have prior social commitment that make them uh, elected for this, from, for this um, scholarship. And then leadership potential, uh, academic readiness, and the other one is plans for social service related to uh, fellowship. This is the dominant figures of it. Um, the dominant figures is uh, most of the scholarship recipients uh, plans for social uh, commitment or contribution uh, related to fellowship and they, ha they also have prior social commitment. I think this is important to keep in mind, um, especially uh, when I, I will talk about it uh, in my uh, notes in the end later. 
So my preliminary findings in this uh, presentation, I will discuss it one by one, but this is only from quantitative data. I even haven't finished analyzing the quantitative data. The information is just a lot, and I really like it because uh, I try to connect one thing with another thing, and also um, it's a quiet story. Like John just said that it's almost 20 years and a lot of stories about it, and if I can uh, build a good connection among the information, that will be very good to uh, make a model of a good scholarship. I mean, the the because the trend is like uh, most countries right now invest in this kind of uh, scholarship programs. So if we can build a kind of model from it, so that will be uh, something in the future. So. To answer your first research question, um, from the perspective of human capital, I divide into, I look at into two aspects, which is, which are first for, uh, during study program, and the second one is after study program. So during study program, um, participation activity with study program uh, done by, by IFP alumni, they did um, attend seminar lectures, university social events, but they did not get involved in political groups or actions, about 63.6%. I think it's good. And the second one is uh, during study program. There are two bars here. The small bars here is a social commitment paid work. It means that they did social uh, paid work and the high bars uh, voluntary work. So if you see these bars, you will uh, get that uh, most of the IFP alumni did a voluntary work more than they did social commitment paid work, which is very good, I think. And then um, form of action ex exercise during study program. Um, most of IEP recipients uh, networking with people like them. I mean, that have backgrounds like them. Maybe they want to uh, build their, their networks in terms or, of organizations. So about 48.40% uh, 40 of them like doing this during study program. Uh, and then the other one is information gathering. They like exchange and gather uh, information. Future goals of IEP fellows after IEP fellowship. This is also one of the things that we need to keep in mind. That is uh, about 77.2% of the IEP alumni uh, consider live and work in my home country as a high priority and live and work in my host country, it's a low priority, and also live and work in another country. Uh, so I think from here we can see that um, they really have uh, a commitment to uh, return to their home country. And then I have fellows expectation about outcome from IVI fellowship in the future. Uh, they expect a lot, but more, most of uh, them say that they expected to um, improve uh, my language, my, my foreign language here, and also build my academic here. So during study program, it's just about, uh, I would like to know the backgrounds, what they did during the study program, and then Look at after study program, how much the changes happened. And also, uh, I will tell about it later. So after study program, they understand what is needed to improve the situation in my home country or community. So this one is surveys about IFP alumni. Uh, they distributed the surveys for in 2007, 2008, 2011, and 2000. 12. So uh, about 50.20% uh, and 
54.10% of them understand what needed to improve the situation in my home country or community. So this is after study program. I will just go uh, over the slides. Uh, let me know if you have questions. So this is outcomes of IFP fellowship uh, about strengthening my commitment to social justice. The percentage here is that how much, uh, how many of the, the IFP alumni thought that IFP fellowship strengthened the commitment to social justice. And then second research question, social capital. Um, this is uh, about uh, in 2011, 51.80% of the DIFI alumni established international contacts. And then uh, this is the percentage of uh, IFP alumni who develop social and communication and leadership skills. I will just go over the slides and give you uh, a glance of the information. The number of IFP alumni who established contact with other IFP alumni after end of fellowship. This is who established contact with alumni in different countries. This is who work together on social justice issues. Who exchange knowledge and information. Uh, this is from uh, culture capital. And okay, let me just go to notes. So my preliminary finding is more about, uh, I think it's more descriptive. What, I'm expect, uh, what I expect to do next is that, um, first of all, um, I have grant files and I would like to do uh, interviews as well for, uh, with the IFP alumni. And uh, I think quality, qualitative data will be very helpful in explaining the details of the returns from IFP. We have quantitative data, but I haven't really uh, figured out how to run statistical analysis, analysis with this data. I think um, if I can do it more than descriptive, that will be good if I can do like uh, some statistic, statistical analysis with this data, that we, what will I do uh, in the future? And the second one is um, it is very good to do a comparative study. I mean, we're not only talking about IFP, but also we analyze, for example, for right scholarships, who also like much older than IFP. If we can do a comparative study between two scholarships that uh, are different, but to some extent uh, have similar features, that will be very, very good. I'm thinking about this in the future, whether it is uh, doable or not. I think that's all from me. Thank you very much. Right, good afternoon, colleagues. Greetings from South Africa. It is an absolute delight to be here today. Um, my, pro, my presentation is basically from a dark to an enlightened continent, an analytical study of the research of Ford Foundation Fellowship Program of the Africa alumni from 2001 to 2013 in the quest to develop African leadership. Now, basically, the main purpose of the study, colleagues, was to show that the program of the IFP was successful, right? Uh, how did I find this information? Is by looking at the archival material and also submitting a questionnaire before the uh, research was undertaken. Uh, research has shown that between 2003 and 12, African researchers more than doubled the production of research in mostly the science and technology. The World Bank report revealed that African researchers produce only 1% of the world's research. For over a decade now, the continent of Africa has undergone a major transformation. In 2000, the economists referred to Africa as the hopeless continent. However, in 2011, they referred to Africa as a rising continent. With the, right, the research methodology that I used. Firstly, the primary resource used was a digital and analog Ford archive housed at Columbia University. The rest of the digital and paper materials were available in a reading room. 
which was very, very easily accessible. Then a quantitative data analysis was explored using a sample of the individual IFP alumni from Africa and the Middle East, Egypt and um, in, uh, Palestine. What did they ask the uh, alumni? What were the employment status of them before the IFP award? What research did they do? And the professional and vocational accomplishments of the uh, alumni on completion of studies. Now the reason that particular information is not in the archives because the, archive, the alumni are situated all over the country and the world and uh, the continent and that material was uh, solicited from the, uh, the what you call uh, questionnaires. Right, the six main challenges facing Africa. One, the economic growth rate is far too low. African industrial development has been stalled since the 1970s. The lives of most Africans are marred by poverty, hunger, poor education, heel health and violence. And every year, more Africans live in urban slums. Corruption was the fifth one, and the imminent changes to the architecture of global trade will also disadvantage African countries. Now, the reason why I use that as a starting point is to show that African solutions for African problems, and IFP, have developed over 1,440 of those alumni to tackle African problems. The primary responsibility for addressing the above challenges rests with Africans. The African continent is full of tremendous promise. In the West, the main point of reference is in the individual, but in African culture, the community is important. There's a Zulu proverb which is uh, known as Umuntu Gumuntu Gabantu which expresses a profound truth embedded in the core of African traditional values. It translates into English as a person is a person because of people. So that is basically the African culture. The Ford Foundation Fellowship Program in Africa offered advanced study opportunities to 1,442 emerging social justice leaders from Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, Nigeria, Palestine, Senegal, South Africa, Tanzania, and Uganda. Right. The distribution of the IFP alumni was, as you can see, South Africa at the most, followed by Nigeria, Egypt, and so on. But uh, this is just to give you an idea that they were nicely distributed throughout the African continent. In preparation for this paper, as I told you, I've asked three questions. The limitations of the questionnaire was that not all the alumni responded, just like how the challenges that uh, the Secretariat had to get information from the alumni for their, their studies, I also had a challenge. Uh, out of 100 and 400 and, uh, 100, 442 people, six uh, 96 responded, but that 96 give a, has given a nice uh, fair assessment of how they have progressed from one job to the other, as you'll see later. Right, the respondents was, South Africa was the most, right, and it's in keeping with the number of alumni that was allocated there. Uganda was second, Mozambique was third, Tanzania was fourth, that's how the responses were. Uh, I'm not going to, the male and female ratio of African alumni is clear here. Uh, the total was 100 and 100, 1,194 MA, 248 PhD, 789 were males, and 653 were females. The male-female ratio, as you can see, as well as the PhD, masters. The IFP partners in Africa, was uh, as from there, you can see Africa had very interesting partners. But from the responses that we had from some of the alumni, some of these partners did not play the game. They did not see to the needs, specific uh, needs of alumni, uh, you know, the personal and academic needs. Uh, the fellowship experience, the general versus the, the pie graph is the general situation with the whole of Africa and uh, uh, 
bar graph is the respondents from the 96 people. And as you can see, most of them uh, in Africa chose health first. Second was environment and development, which is true because Africa is a rural country, so environment and development of rural areas were paramount. The current location of the IFP alumni from Africa, 88 or of the 96 are in their own country, which is 92%, and eight of them are outside the country, and mostly because they are studying and pursuing the PhD degrees. The impact of IFP in Africa, firstly, Dr. Joan Dessen, uh, in a conference held in Senegal, stated that more, uh, IFP was more than just a scholarship, but involves a series of trainings to equip recipients to become good leaders in the, country, in the communities. She further elaborated that the job of the IFP was not to take positions in these kinds of debates, but to provide opportunities for people to advance their knowledge. She reminded participants about the objectives of the IFP program, and she stated statistically that about 15 to 20 percent of fellows proceeded to doctoral programs on other recognized scholarships like Budiyeh. The impact of the program in Africa, at the same conference, was Araba Botchway, the IFP coordinator for Ghana, described the IFP alumni as social entrepreneurs who could be regarded as uncommon heroes in pursuit of social justice. At the same time, she stated that the uncommon heroes, because they are mostly of the alumni, would not have had this opportunity, like myself, in view of the backgrounds to higher education if it was not for the scholarship. The current economic activity of the alumni. The survey conducted with the alumni revealed that 79% of the respondents have improved their vocational status from where they were to where they now. On coming back from the studies, the IFP alumni came back at a higher level than when they left, acquiring more skills, knowledge, networks, and exposure, and confidence level. 9% of the respondents have not improved their work experience. 7% of the alumni are pursuing further studies. And there was only one out of the 96 that is unemployed. As you can see here, bulk of them are improved. Nine of them have the same job. Seven are studying and five have their own business. The role of the IFP alumni in promoting social justice. There's a whole lot of uh, uh, attributes that they've acquired during the study process that they can use very effectively. And I'm gonna go through that just now. Highlights. The highlights of the African alumni. The formation of alumni associations contributed to bringing the alumni to share the experiences before and after the fellowship. Task force groups were formed to mediate action towards a nucleus formation. Because the international partner established structures provided valuable and encouraging information to emerging al alumni al associations, for example, the Mozambique Alumni Association was formed after taking the South African and Kenyan and Nigerian examples into consideration. Some associations launched publications for the benefit of people living with disabilities and alumni, alumnus who was totally blind, joined the Teacher Service Commission as a commissioner. IFP Kenya alumni profile was published in 2005 and another one in 2012. There is a good representation of the alumni in the institutions of higher education in countries where many of them are members of faculty in different universities. At the policy level, the alumni have gained access to elective positions. Some are members of parliament, some are councillors in local government, some are members of parliament in the national government. One alumnus who studied development in Clark University and who comes from the most marginalized community has received an international award to implement a rain farming project. Others have been appointed to high offices, including one fellow studying public policy 
who was elected into the United Nations Youth Advisory Board. The alumni in Kenya contributed towards the constitutional making processes in the country. Some innovative projects that they did. Projects on sustainable use of natural resources at community level were introduced. Programs to improve crop yield, enhance food security, presentations and outreach programs by alumni at universities to popularize the program. Students living in remote areas were assisted by creating a website. Organized public art exhibition for the need, special needs people. Teacher training and professional development. Through the African Higher Education Collaborative Program, material were publicized for the benefit of others. Cooperation and collaboration work in art therapy field between IFP Egyptian alumni and other African alumni. Arranging programs to observe 16 days of activism, for example. Conducting infection control training. Arranging and participating in projects would deal with women's rights. Support families with disabled children. The annual Africa partner meetings was the main source of interaction for regional partners. Programs aimed at developing the skills of alumni to address housekeeping issues. Encouraging the buddy system between alumni. The creation of a website. The publication of a resource book. Alumni members arranged for presentations based on their own experience. In many cases, alumni were afforded an observer status in the interview process for fellows elect. Information of alumni and students were made available to all other students. Outward workshops were held. Rural economic development and livelihoods were provided for. The implementation of social justice in rural areas. Capacity building. Establishment of uh, dynamic schools for children. Joint community actions for peace. The challenges and benefits were learning experience for the alumni. I'm not going to go through the challenges, but I'm going to look at the future of the alumni in promoting social justice. After analyzing 10 years' worth of investment data of the Ford Foundation, there is one way that the overall success and impact of the ambitious program that can be measured is to create a network with all the African alumni in order to take the pro uh, continent to a higher level. And it is proposed that we create an organization, for example, like the Africa Regional Association for Leadership and Social Justice. Many of the respondents that answered the question is 95% of them said they will join that association in order to improve Africa. 91 uh, participants, 95% responded that they will want to join the association. What will the association do? Host meetings, networks forged, having an opportunity uh, to use the skills to develop Af uh, Africa as a continent. The skills that alumni can put into these organizations can help them grow in size and magnitude. And a whole lot of other issues. It is clear from here, la ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, that the Africa Regional Association for Leadership and Social Justice that is proposed can be a catalyst for change in the African continent. The analytical framework developed to guide the conduct of a successful organization can be found within seven interdependent dimensions. One, the external context, stakeholders, internal features and resources, external intervention, capacity, endogenous change and adaptation, and performance. The African continent as is seen by the, uh, the, uh, the development of the African alumni, is characterized by many issues that need urgent attention. Poverty, inequality, corruption, low, low economic growth, etc. This forms the basis of the external context that need to be addressed. The most important resource to address this is the fully capacitated IFP alumni who have acquired the necessary academic and professional skills to tackle these problems head on. Together with these skills, they have the capacity to deliver on this mandate, as seen by the innovative strategies that unfolded when the alumni associations were formed. These, together with the other dimensions described above, 
who will make this association a force to be reckoned with. In this way, the legacy of the Ford Foundation IFP will live on forever. If nothing is done, dear colleagues, then we have to say goodbye to this very successful program, which will find its place in the archival records of the rare book and manuscript library of Columbia University. And I am saying, and that is why I'm remaining here till Monday, to be going to that Ford Foundation uh, seminar on funding to get funding to ensure that the African Regional Association for Leadership and Social Justice is implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Three really interesting and very different um, presentations. So um, I'm aware that we are running a little behind time, so, um, but we still want to leave some time for questions and discussion because we've um, We've um, heard some really interesting information presented here. So I do want to open it up for questions. And I see the first hand going up from Joan. <laughs> I, 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 I totally can't resist. And I, I want to congratulate you all. This is wonderful to see you put your research skills to work on, on this project. And uh, you know, I think this is just a, a small foreshadowing of the kind of uh, work that will be done if the project, if the archives are, are utilized. Uh, so there are many, many questions that could be asked. And what I thought was remarkable, if one puts all three presentations together, is how different they were. Uh, and how uh, the approaches are still uh, substantiated by all different kinds of data. So that, that validates the notion of the archive, just, just for starters. Specifically, um, I'd just like to uh, c make a quick comment on each of the three presentations. Vim, I thought yours was, you just um, hit it spot on in terms of, at least as we saw, the tensions in the program. And so your analytical reading of these documents that we perhaps didn't really intend to be perused uh, from the point of view of a researcher, uh, but were memos of the day, uh, you know, I think you were able to uh, gather a lot about what was in fact the central tension of the program uh, between a, some kind of global vision uh, and, and that had an operational side to it uh, and the, this very, very strong centrifugal force uh, when, uh, which uh, gave a great deal of substance and autonomy intentionally uh, to the local organizations. So I thought just as a general reaction that your, um, your understanding of that central tension, which was in fact our major uh, conceptual issue in the program, was very close to the heart of what we struggled with every single day. So congratulations for that reading. Uh, however, you didn't solve it exactly, but I think that like a good historian, you, you looked at the evolution of our thinking. So that was very, really fascinating. Bodhi, I'd just like to uh, congratulate you. I see this doctoral dissertation emerging here. And I'd like to make a suggestion that now wearing my current hat as a professor, uh, reacting to your research design, if you uh, were interested in exploring some of the human capability theory uh, around development issues, which unlike human capital theory focuses, does not focus exclusively on human capital for economic growth strategies, but is more people-centered and really uh, envisions the ways in which people can develop a whole range of capabilities, that might be a useful framework for you. And Raj, finally, uh, you know, uh, you're always proposing things. This doesn't surprise me. Uh, uh, but I think, you put your, I think you put your finger on something really important, which is, uh, you know, to what degree do the alumni then become the leaders of the next generation of this sort of effort? And Vim, that was something that you were actually uh, able to detect. We, we, the, the locus, the center of gravity began to change as more and more alumni were created in the program. Uh, and now you're asking, Raj, the second generation question or the third or fourth generation question, which is, 
how is this not a uh, simply a legacy, an exercise in historical uh, self-congratulation, but how does it actually continue to generate uh, African solutions to African problems uh, and multiply, of course. So uh, congratulations to all of you. Fascinating uh, work and much discussion to be had. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to say thank you, because um, as someone who is a data-driven person, I can appreciate all the research that each one of you has gone through painlessly, um, through pages perhaps no one ever thought would ever be seen again. Um, and with that, um, because there was a lot of information presented, um, as someone who comes from a bicultural background, there's always, I think, this challenge of the external context. And um, something that I think might be helpful for uh, maybe the alumni and any of the researchers, if you're not aware of, in addition to the wonderful partnership that now is with Columbia, but there's a Center for Social Innovation um, in New York City. It's the only one in the US. The other locations are in Toronto. And I would suggest developing a partnership with that. I'd like to be a conduit to introduce that because there are everyday people who, much like the observation with the TOEFL, where villagers, everyday people who may have solutions to social context issues and social justice problems are not able to gain scholarships because of their limitations either in funding or access to certain testing. The Center for Social Innovation offers folks the opportunity to come in and work on their ideas to um, make the world a better place for people and, and um, the planet as a whole. And um, I would like to just offer that as an observation that I think some next steps are to create a worldwide hub of uh, change makers. And I think Columbia is a great place to do that because of the universality of the wisdom that's presented here. And uh, I just wanted to offer that as an observation. Thank you. Uh, just a short comment. So in May 2015, I established, I launched an initiative. I, I was here, from here. So uh, I call it Learn for the Future. And uh, it's like uh, more than a year right now. I have like uh, more than 10,000 uh, students registered for that course. And uh, all of them are Indonesians. They live throughout Indonesia. And also some of them live in other countries like Hong Kong. Um, Egypt, even Egypt, uh, Germany, and so on. So this kind of uh, initiative is actually inspired by IFP. Like, uh, I really want to reach those who live in disadvantaged conditions. I think if we can help them to get on their food and get these opportunities, we will start um, uh, building a future generation that can uh, solve the problems in the future. And I would like to say that I will soon be visiting your offices. Uh, <laughs> the reason why is because from the alumni that have responded to those questionnaires, they are so overwhelming in support of trying to do something innovative to assist with Africa's problems. And I think the only way we can do that is to ensure that people, and, and uh, the association that is proposed, is not only uh, restricted to IFP alumni, but other alumni, in Africa that can contribute effectively from getting uh, the academic knowledge uh, unfolding into realistic uh, solutions to problems. So we will be seeing you. So I think we should now bring this to a close and thank you all for your observations. I just want to very quickly just say a couple of things in closing. First off, Woody, when you're done with your degree, 
please check with us. We, <laughs> we would love to have you come and uh, partner with us on our research. Uh, we are asking many of the same questions at IIE as part of our tracking study and really dealing with the same complexity of how do you really go beyond some of the, the, the quote unquote softer outcomes of these types of programs like um, a better cultural understanding, et cetera, et cetera, and how do you really get down to looking at what the actual impacts have been at the ground level. So I think that that's a big challenge and it's interesting to see how it's been playing out um, in uh, the research of others also. What I also want to point out because what also was very evident from all the presentations was that they're obviously um, driven by what's currently available in the archives. And to that extent, it's wonderful to see how the archives are being leveraged. And this is just the start, we hope. Um, but that all of the data from the IIE tracking study will eventually also make it into the archives. So with a lot of the information you were presenting, it went through only the life of the program and now all of the data is being generated about what's really continuing to happen with the alumni. So um, as you all continue your work um, and your research to, um, to keep checking back with the Columbia archives, checking back with us on whether our data has also been made available in the archives for the use of researchers because it really shows you what's happening now with, uh, with the alumni. So with that, I want to thank all of our panelists and uh, give them a big round of applause for their terrific work.